Are you optimistic? Is your glass half full or half empty? Maybe that's the wrong question. The glass is the container. The glass is your life. And if we have this container of life, we need to appreciate that we're here. That's kidney transplant recipient and author of The Incurable Optimist, Jennifer Kramer Miller. I'm Monica Fox, Senior Director of Outreach and Government Relations for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois, and your host for this edition of The Journey Continues. Jennifer joins us for this episode of The Journey Continues to share how she became the incurable optimist. Jennifer, tell me about your college life and the plans you had for after. Well, hello, Monica. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. And yeah, so my story started right after college. So I grew up in Minnesota. Then I went to school at the University of Puget Sound, which is in Washington State. And I had a lovely four years at a small private school there where I made so many friends. I got a business degree, a psychology minor, and I graduated really feeling like I was ready to launch into the world. So it was an ideal college experience. But it was soon after college, I had moved to Seattle with my best friend, and I lived in a pretty apartment, and I got a promising PR position. And suddenly I woke up one day and my eyes were puffy. I felt off. I felt tired. And it was at that point that I made a doctor appointment and pretty much everything changed. So you went to that doctor appointment and what was that life-changing diagnosis that you received? So I went to the doctor thinking that I'd have something medically familiar like you do. I thought maybe I had a virus or a flu, but instead he had me, you know, pee in a cup and said that there was protein in my urine. And protein has no place in your urine. A healthy kidney will not allow protein to pass through. And I kind of compare it to like a coffee filter. It does not let coffee grounds go into your cup of coffee. So it was like my urine had coffee grounds in it, if you compare that to protein. And he said that that is a sign of kidney damage. And I would need to have a biopsy to determine the cause and extent of the damage. That was very shocking to me, but I didn't really know how to put my brain around that at that time because I was 22. You know, I just didn't have any any knowledge about kidneys or kidney health. And so my uh, family was still in Minnesota and they wanted me to come home and get the biopsy in Minneapolis because my dad, a custom home builder, had built a house for a nephrologist. His name was Dr. Brown. And at the time, Dr. Brown hired my dad for his expertise in custom home building. We never knew that we would ever need Dr. Brown's expertise in nephrology. So I did get the biopsy in Minneapolis with Dr. Brown and quickly learned that I had kidney disease. I'm sure some of your listeners know it. It's got a very long name. It's focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, which is way too many syllables. So FSGS for short. And that particular kidney condition had two words associated with it, which were really hard for me to kind of process at 22. But those words were incurable and progressive. So I didn't quite know what was ahead for me, but I knew I was, you know, going to be on a rocky road. So you received a diagnosis and you were told it was incurable and progressive. How did you feel? I really felt like I'd been ripped away from my rightful place in the world. I mean, I was, I had left Seattle thinking I was going to get a quick fix and come back. I thought, I'll be back. You know, I said to some of my friends, I'll, I'll see you for Sarah's party, which was like in 10 days. Sarah, just a friend. And I was not back in 10 days. I mean, I was in kind of a two-pronged stage of thinking about it. One was I felt a lot of despair. Like, why is this happening to me? What happened to my like happy-go-lucky 22-year-old life? And on the other hand, I had sort of a like a creative denial, but I don't even know if it counts as denial because I just didn't have enough knowledge about what can happen with kidney disease and kidney 
you know, complications. So I thought I would get better and go back and resume my life. I'd reclaim my life. And, you know, Monica, I had kidney failure in six months. So it was very rapid. And that six months was kind of a rapid decline in all things. To treat it or to try to correct it, the first course of action was a giant dose of prednisone. And for a while, I really, you know, I really was hoping and praying prednisone was going to do the trick and I was going to get better. And they kept increasing the dose because it wasn't working. And I was on such a large dose, four time a day dose at the end of kind of this last ditch attempt to save my kidneys. And my hair fell out. I got chipmunk cheeks, my arms and legs became very, you know, muscle wasted and very thin. And I, I had lost a lot of weight. I lost my hair. I really lost my sense of self. So I was in a lot of despair. And on the flip side of that, I was like, I got to get through this. I got to get through this so I can get back to my life in Seattle. So you mentioned your family and hearing, you know, the way that you felt based on your diagnosis and what you were going through and so quickly, what impact did all this have on your family? It had such a big impact. You know, I really think kidney disease is, it's a family affair. I mean, it really is, right? You know this too. It's just, it's interesting. So I wrote in Curable Optimist, you know, 30 years after this happened. So I had a lot of perspective that was different than I had when I was 22. And when I was 22, I wasn't a mom. So my mom is just an amazing mother. And she was really with me every step of the way. She has this really great way of sort of alchemizing hardships into humor. And I just like adore the fact that she was able to do that in this experience. So for example, this is the example I always give is I would say to her, mom, I have an appointment tomorrow, you know, at two o'clock. Like, do you want to come with me? And she'd always say, I'd love to. What a riot. And she started calling all my appointments riots. So, you know, it became sort of a shorthand. I'd say, hey, mom, you want to have a riot tomorrow? And she'd go, yeah, I'd love to have a riot. It was just funny, you know, like just this sort of spirit that we would have together going through this, these things just made me appreciate and love her even more. And I didn't know that was possible, but it felt like we were going through it together. I mean, it was affecting her daughter. And now that I'm a mother, I have a daughter myself. I had such a different perspective in writing the book about what she must have been going through and just keeping that positive outlook along with me as we were both quite concerned about what was happening. And my dad as well was, you know, I always thought of him sort of as this like take charge CEO in different situations with Dr. Brown trying to figure out how we're going to solve this problem. And we were really all in it together. And as the story plays out, well, I don't know if we mentioned this at the beginning, but in this 30 some years since I was 22, I've had four kidney transplants and four is a lot. I always have to acknowledge that because there's usually when I give talks, there's usually kind of an audible gasp at that point. So yes, we can acknowledge four is a lot, but I have been able to, you know, despite all the uncertainty that comes with living and with and managing incurable disease, autoimmune kidney disease, I have been blessed by this sort of family love. So I think incurable optimist is really a family love story. And back to my mom, she tried to give me her kidney for my first transplant, which was in 1990. And they said that she didn't have enough matching antigens. So I was on the waiting list. And eventually, after a year and eight months on dialysis, I received a deceased organ donor from the waiting list. But for my third transplant, if we jump ahead to 2002, the antigen matching criteria had changed. And at that point, they said that my mom could give me her kidney. So after she had done so much for me through all these years, and at this point, by the time I got my third transplant, I was grateful and happy to be married, and I had my daughter by that point. 
that's when my mom was able to donate her kidney to me. So like I said, back to a family affair, it's never stopped being a family situation. That is really, truly a family love story. And I can relate to you about, you know, the love of a mother. Um, My mother is an amazing, wonderful person. And I too have a daughter. And your mom, I can only imagine. I, I love that she was able to be so upbeat and positive for you through your journey. Yeah. Because I know how helpful that was. It was so helpful. And and then it became kind of a loop where we would do it for each other because I had asked her, you know, years later, how did you get through that? I can't imagine my daughter going through what I went through and how that would feel from the perspective of being a mother. And she said, well, your attitude kept me upbeat. And I said, well, your attitude kept me upbeat. So it became kind of a perfect loop where we were able to lift each other up. It's really beautiful. You said it was 30 years since your, the beginning of your journey that you decided to write your memoir. Was it difficult reliving your painful experiences? You know, it really was pretty difficult because the funny thing is I wrote a book in 2013 just for my family and friends because my daughter, my adorable daughter, I just thought one day, what if I got hit by a bus? And she didn't know all the things that I went through and what a miracle she is to be here. And one of the reasons she's such a miracle is after my second transplant, which was a deceased donor transplant, I was able to get pregnant. So that gift of life not only gave me additional time to make memories and live a good life, it allowed me to create a life. And I just wanted her to know. Her name is Liza, and I wanted Liza to know you're a miracle, and I wanted it on paper. And so I was just inspired to write that, and I did. I wrote a book for family and friends, but it really was for family and friends. And then later, I worked with a book coach because I love to write. I was taking a lot of classes and workshops in writing, and she read it, and she said, this is a very lovely book for your family and friends, but let's rework it so that you can get it published for a broad audience. And the main thing that she said was you have to get uglier. You have to really tell people, like you had kidney failure at 22 years old. That must have been so hard, but you have to tell people how hard. You have to make them understand what you were going through. Doing that, reliving that, going back to those places where you know I had journals and I dove into them and it was hard. I felt like I had to kind of see it and taste it and smell it and dive back into it. And it was difficult times, but there's kind of something nice about being able to go in and bring it up and write it down. Once I got it on the page, it didn't bring me down. Like I I felt like it was, you know, kind of therapeutic, but I didn't go into despair by reliving it, but it was definitely difficult. And so even though your path was difficult, parts of your book are really funny. Why'd you use so much humor in the book? I think humor is one of the best things that there is that we have available to us. And like I was telling you about my mom, so much of what helped us get through everything was humor. I can tell you, Monica, when I was on dialysis, and I remember my mom and my brother and I went to a movie, and I had a lot going on. I remember I kind of tried to prop my legs up because they felt swollen and I was trying to get them elevated. And it was a funny movie. And I just remember laughing. And I just had this realization to myself that, you know, you can't take away my laughter. Like no matter what's going on, I'm going to still laugh because that's available to me. And I started to curate sort of my, what I call my lucky list, uh, the things that at their essence, you can't take them away. And it was the love of my family and the love of people around me. And laughter was a big thing on my lucky list. So in writing the book, you know, I believe life is kind of a mix. It's a big mix of beauty and bummers. And there is beauty in the bummers. And laughter exists in all stages of my experiences, even the hardest times in the hospital 
there have been really funny things that have happened. So I find that joy and laughter is always available to us, no matter what we're going through. And I'm glad that you found that humor in the book because that is important to me. I think that's wonderful. It was important to me too. And, you know, sometimes you have to laugh through the pain. (laughs) You really do. And if you can recognize those moments in the painful moments, there's just something soul satisfying about laughing. So we talked about your transplants. You've had four. Yep. Which is, is, you know, I have a friend who's had four. Okay, good. And um, And I are in the same club. I'm glad someone else is out there. Yes. So your first two were deceased donor transplants. Correct. And your third was from your mom. And the fourth? And the fourth is another magical story. So the third from my mom felt very magical. But in my fourth transplant, which I'm so happy to tell you, Monica, was just over 12 years ago. And this is the longest lasting kidney transplant I've had yet. Wonderful. So that's very exciting. Thank you so much. So actually, my husband wanted to donate his kidney to me. He was very determined and he wasn't a match. So he said, there's got to be a way. I'm going to figure this out. And there was a way. And he participated in the Paired Exchange Program. And I'm going to guess that um, many of your listeners know what it is. But for those who might not, the Paired Exchange Program is this game-changing program in kidney transplantation where people like me who had a donor who is available to me but wasn't a match go into a pool of people, of donors with recipients that don't match. And that pool creates a greater opportunity for people to kind of swap kidneys. It's almost like a kidney swap. So my husband Dirk's kidney matched a man in North Dakota And in turn, I received a kidney, and this is super cool, from a 25-year-old altruistic donor. So my donor didn't direct his kidney to anybody, just out of the goodness of his heart, he chose to donate his kidney. And I'll never forget when my transplant coordinator called me and said, yeah, we have a good donor for you. He's been thinking about it for a long time. He'd like to get the surgery done as soon as possible. He's 25 years old. And I said, how long could he have possibly been thinking about it if he's 25? I just, I couldn't believe it. It just was just amazing. So there are a lot of miracles that I think we experience as kidney transplant recipients. I am the board chair of the Minnesota National Kidney Foundation. So Monica, we both are involved with the National Kidney Foundation. It's such a wonderful organization. And I just feel like we are exposed to some stories that are just the best of humanity. I mean, I'm just continually blown away by stories of people donating their kidneys to other people. We do have two kidneys and we need one, but it's a significant decision to look into living donation and decide it's something you want to do. And I just think living donors are heroes and all the stories that we hear about the people and their benevolence to save other people, to save family, friends, and strangers is really, really remarkable. Living donors are absolute heroes. We can't express that enough. And I'm just so happy that you received the gift that you needed every time you needed it. I just can't help to ask at this point, how did you stay so positive through all of those transplants? I had to work at it. But like I said before, I have just found so much joy in being alive. And you you kind of uh, talked about this at the very beginning, like, is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? I just realized early on that might be the wrong question. And the way that I realized that was through a tragedy. I was on dialysis in center like we talked about young in my 20s, I was kind of the young gal at dialysis, a lot of elderly patients that I befriended. It'd be kind of, I like to say it was sort of like a medical version of Cheers where I would go and everybody knows your name. We had a lot of camaraderie at our dialysis unit. So that was another thing for a not great place to go. We managed to um, forge some friendships 
But there was a technician there named Tom, and Tom was in his 30s. Everybody loved him. He was the one who would, you know, get the fistula needles in and expertly, and he just was a very calming presence. I, you know, one time I had a blood pressure crash, which any of your dialysis patients listening know that that can happen when fluid is pulled too quickly, your blood pressure can drop. And and that happened and Tom righted my blood pressure and just, so Tom was an amazing man and paragon of perfect health. One day I went in to the unit, everybody was sad. Sue, the social worker, told me that Tom had died the night before he had a brain aneurysm. And it was so sudden and so out of the blue and tragic. And I looked around this dialysis unit and there was this really, she was such a character. Her name was Olga and she was in her 80s. And I thought, how is it possible that Olga and me and everyone else in this room that were the sick ones out lived Tom, the healthy one. And at that moment, I realized there's no pre-written script to what's going to happen to any of us. And so if we're alive, we have to really save our life. That was when I thought to myself, you know what? Glass half full, glass half empty. That's not the right question because the glass is the container. The glass is your life. And if we have this container of life, we need to appreciate that we're here. And that has stayed with me all these years. And I really just, I savor being here. And I have so much joy for being, you know, blessed by these transplants and these people that I love and people who love me. I can look at a blue sky and be so grateful that I've got a blue sky overhead. Or, you know, I can eat potassium foods now with my kidney transplant and I can love an avocado like nobody else. And So it's just really a matter of paying attention to what we have in our lives and just savoring it. You have received so much support from your family, your parents. You talk about that. And consequently, you do a lot to give back. Tell me some of the things that you do to give back. I would be happy to tell you because I find it so rewarding. So yeah, I feel like I've been sort of steeped in gratitude with all of this benevolence that's come my way, the least that I can do is give back to other people who are managing uncertainty and trying to hold on to hope and find joy. And so my involvement with the National Kidney Foundation has been really, really rewarding. One of the things that I do is the National Kidney Foundation has a peer mentoring program. And so I'm a peer mentor and I have mentees that I talk to on a regular basis about their journeys. And I feel like I have a lot of experience and empathy to share. And I love doing that. And then my involvement as the board chair, we just had our kidney walk here in Minneapolis. And it was just a fantastic turnout. I actually had some books available there. And I have just these wonderful stories of people coming up to me and telling me about their kidney transplant stories. Or in particular, there was a woman who gave her kidney to her son, and he had had that kidney for 34 years, which is amazing. But she said to me, I don't know if he appreciates how lucky he is. Like, I, I just want you to talk to him. And I told him, you know, how amazing that is. And he shared with me some feelings that he has about, you know, feeling a little bit different and not quite understanding how he should accept this fact that he's a kidney patient. We had a great talk about it and it felt very uplifting for for both of us. And his mom gave me the biggest hug. Every time something like that happens, I feel like we're this community, we're a kidney community And I'm so happy to be able to participate in that community and help kidney patients where I can through my own experiences, because I'm kind of like a frequent flyer at this point. I have had a lot of experiences. And like I was saying about my peer mentoring, I thought, you know, if there was a way I could like talk to people more broadly, that would be wonderful. And I feel like my book has really been effective in that. Giving back, when I talk to my mentees, that's one of my greatest tips, 
is I think sometimes when we go through hard things, we can start to kind of stew in our own juices a little bit, but we're not the only one who goes through hard things. And by reaching out to others, it's such a great way to get outside of ourselves and be of service to people. And when we can be of service to people, it's a win-win. Not only does it help the people that we're serving, but it helps us. I'm also a Donate Life ambassador because I really believe in the miracles of organ donation. I mean, how could I not? The other thing I believe I'm so aligned with you on this, Monica, is that the best way to help people learn about something is through stories. If you just read a Donate Life or a National Kidney Foundation brochure about something, that's very goes into the brain very differently than when you hear an actual story about someone's life. So I love your podcast. I love that by sharing stories, I think we really have greater empathy and understanding. You are absolutely correct. So what gives you hope for the future of kidney disease? There are so many hopeful things going on right now in the kidney community in Minnesota, right here, like in my backyard. I know we have uh, Medtronic. And they have spun off into a new company. Medtronic and DaVita have merged into a company called Mozark. And some of the innovations that they are doing, they are developing a new fistula. In fact, it's developed where their fistula development, and I don't want to get into too much of the technicalities about it, but for patients, it will not result in as large of kind of a, my fistula is 30 some years old, which is great that it's lasted that long, but it's not, it's a little unsightly. You know, I like to cover it up because there's a large um, bulge where the artery and the vein are connected. It was a difficult surgical procedure. It had some elements to it that were difficult. This new fistula that they're developing, there's no surgery. It's just one needle stick and you're out of there. So that's really cool, I think, for dialysis patients. But some of the other great innovations that we're hearing about, they're really working on artificial kidneys where someone wouldn't have to be tethered to a dialysis machine. And then there's a fabulous company called Miro Matrix and many others that are developing xenotransplantation, which is actually transplants from pig kidneys. They get these kidneys from the food supply, and they're taking these pig kidneys, and they're washing the cells out and creating a scaffold. They have a couple phases, but in phase two, they're going to be able to potentially take my cells if I needed another transplant, or your cells if you needed another transplant someday, and you would get a kidney with your own cells, and you wouldn't have to take medication. So that would be a huge game changer for kidney transplantation. And also their goal is to eliminate the waiting list. In this scenario, if everything goes as planned, there would not be a waiting list. You need a kidney, you'd get one in six weeks. So there's a lot to be hopeful for in the kidney community for the innovations that are in the works. So my last question for you is what takeaways do you have for others undertaking a journey like yours? Well, I think that it's really important for kidney patients to be proactive about their health and to know your whys. For example, if a kidney patient is on dialysis and they, you know, you're told don't eat too much potassium. Well, know why that is. Like potassium in high doses for a compromised kidney patient, especially a dialysis patient who might not have any kidney function, it can be fatal to eat too much potassium. If you know that versus just think, I shouldn't eat potassium, but maybe I want to eat this baked potato anyway, I really think it's important to know why you need to comply with certain things for your health because it makes it easier to comply when you know your reasons. And to be an empowered kidney patient, I think you really need to know why you're preserving your health. There's so many things, the potassium limitations, phosphorus limitations, your fluid, managing fluid. So I think the best patients handle their health by really being proactive and 
There is so much information available. The National Kidney Foundation website, for example, is a wealth of information. And also curate your lucky list when things are hard, like look around and realize if you have a spouse or a family member or friends who help you and love you, let them love you and appreciate the people around you. And really exercise, I think, is really important. It's very good for your mental health to keep moving in any capacity that you can, even if that's just a a stroll after dinner every night. Just really try to focus on moving your body to keep your health and spirits up. All great takeaways. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing such great information. I certainly hope that everyone will run out and get your book because it's full of so much more of your story and so much more encouraging and helpful information. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you so much. Everyone's kidney journey is different, and so are the ways we cope with it. At NKFI, we have patient programs, networking, and volunteer opportunities. To find out more information and to get involved with us, go to nkfi.org. I'm Monica Fox, and this is The Journey Continues. Prevention is a key part of our mission at the Kidney Foundation. That's why at the end of each episode, Dr. Melissa Prest offers a health tip. Here's today's nutrition tip about meal planning and prepping. If you're looking for ways to increase your success with diet changes, then look no further to how you are meal planning and prepping. Done well, you will find that you are saving money on groceries, time, and allowing you to reach your health goals. Here are some tips to help you master meal planning and prepping. Start small and plan out a few meals and snacks. You'll find what works well for you and what doesn't, and then you can build by adding in more meals and snacks to your plan. Think of making a healthy plate with a protein choice, a carb choice, and fruits and vegetables for your meals and snacks. Get your kitchen and pantry organized so you can see what you already have on hand and what you need to buy. Plus, you can quickly find things that you need when you have an organized kitchen. You can also shop your pantry first when putting together your meal plan. Make sure you have some good food storage containers to keep your prepared meals and snacks. Keep a few variety of herbs and spices on hand to help you create tasty meals. Schedule your meal plan time and your meal prep time so that you are sure to have time to do both. Always head to the grocery store with a list and do not shop when hungry. This helps keep you on a budget, on task, and limits those impulse purchases. Batch cook and freeze. You could batch cook food like pasta, rice, or barley and use it for a variety of dishes during the week. The same with vegetables. They can be cooked or chopped and can be spread out among many meals. You can also freeze some of the meals that you create and save it for another week. Prep your fruits and vegetables when you get home from the grocery store. This will save you time when you need to use them for recipes. And make a plan for leftovers and when you will use them in your meal plan. With today's nutrition tip, I'm Melissa Prest, a registered dietitian nutritionist and the foundation dietitian for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois.